Hey guys, welcome to the channel. In this video, we're ranking every main series Zelda game by just one factor, the villain. Next year, The Legend of Zelda turns 35, which is old enough to run for president, and in that time, the series has amassed quite a rogues gallery of villains and villainesses. They range from the scary, to the silly, to the tragic, and sometimes combine all of the above. When I think about what makes Zelda games great, I think about dungeons and puzzles, exploration, a deep mythology, and a memorable cast of characters. But I also think about the impact of villains. A terrific villain can turn a good game into a great game, and some Zelda villains are as legendary as the series itself. This is not a scientific list, but some of the criteria considered were the depth and relevance of the villain's backstory, how well their personality and motivations are fleshed out, the effect of the villain on the game world, their general level of scariness, the success of their plans, and any boss fights they might engage in. Of course, all of these criteria are subjective, so your mileage may vary. I'd genuinely love to hear your ranking, and more importantly, your reasoning in the comments. A few quick notes. First, we're only talking about the 19 main series games. No CDI games, no Hyrule Warriors, and no Link's crossbow training. Second, spoilers abound for all these games. If you haven't played a game on this list and you're keen to experience it completely blind, you might want to skip bits of this video. Finally, what this list is not. This is not a ranking of Zelda games taken as a whole. There are games on the bottom half of this list that I enjoy immensely, and one game in the top five that I actively dislike. This is also not a ranking of Zelda villains themselves. For example, Ganon appears in 11 main series games, but his impact varies from game to game, and each of his appearances will be ranked separately. This really ballooned into a massive video, so buckle up because you're in for a marathon. We're ranking every Zelda game from worst to first on the strength of its villain, starting right now. Number 19. Zelda 2 – The Adventure of Link Zelda 2 has to take the bottom spot because it doesn't actually have a villain. Plus, most of what we know about the plot can only be learned by reading the game's manual. The inciting incident behind The Adventure of Link occurred an unspecified number of generations before the events of the game, when a benevolent king hid the Triforce of Courage to prevent anyone from abusing its power, or as the manual helpfully states, for a reason. The only way for anyone to reclaim the Triforce is by placing six magic crystals in six palaces scattered around the realm, which will unlock a seventh palace that actually houses the Triforce of Courage. Each of the palaces is protected by magical guardians, which the king created in order to test the combat prowess of anyone hoping to claim the Triforce. Shortly before his death, the king confides this information in his daughter, Princess Zelda. After the king dies, his son enlists the help of a power-hungry court magician to extort the information out of Zelda, but she stonewalls them. Enraged, the magician does some magic chanting, and Zelda falls into a deep, long-lasting sleep. <laughs> Fast forward to the start of this game, and Link is setting out with a bag of crystals to fulfill the king's quest and wake up Princess Zelda. Meanwhile, but completely unrelated, Ganon's minions are beginning to quote-unquote work devilishly towards the revival of Ganon, but there's one thing they still need. Not the enemy. According to the manual, Ganon can be revived by sacrificing Link and sprinkling his blood on the ashes of Ganon, which seems like irresponsible information for Nintendo to make available to the public, but what do I know? It seems to be a coincidence that these two things are happening at the same time, which means the plot to revive Ganon is basically the B story to the Magic Crystal Sleeping Beauty narrative. I think it's safe to say that the dev team were more concerned with crafting a playable adventure game than telling a compelling story. There's no focal point villain, not much in-game text to suggest any kind of stakes, and the backstory in the manual provides more questions than answers. It's not totally clear which enemies are attempting to revive Ganon, and which are merely testing Link's worthiness to use the Triforce. The manual doesn't explain whether brainless tektites and bog slimes are in on the Ganon revival plot, or how anyone will be able to perform the aforementioned ash and blood ritual if Link dies by falling into lava. Now, unless you were save scumming like a fiend, there's statistically zero chance that you actually beat this game without dying, which means you'll be seeing this screen a lot. The game over screen is Ganon's one and only intrusion on the plot, but it doesn't actually count, because in the canonical version of events, Link never dies. No, no, that's not what happened. This means that our so-called villain spends the entire game as an unthinking, unrevived pile of ash. If you've ever played a Zelda game before, you kind of expect that a villain revival plot will culminate in at least partial success, but nope, not this time. The final boss of Zelda 2, Thunderbird, has almost nothing to do with anything else in the game and isn't really villainous. He's simply the last guardian created by the old king to protect the Triforce of Courage. So beyond completionism, there's no special satisfaction in taking him down. After defeating Thunderbird, there's also an unexpected final room, where an old man has spent years waiting for the chosen hero to appear. 
knew you would come. At this point, the plot to revive Ganon has been completely forgotten, and the final, final boss fight against Link's shadow is nothing more than a bizarre last-second hazing ritual. You will now wrestle my cousin Mo! No, okay, all right, all right, it's Wrestle over. him to the this ground! This is over, okay? No, just no, don't. You're a freak. I'm not doing this I'm anymore, and this is over. Goodbye. Number 18. Four Swords. Four Swords is the game that introduced us to Vati, the Minish turned Wind Mage turned Purple Cyclops blob monster. Vati's claim to fame in the Zelda series is clocking the second most appearances behind the OG villain himself, Ganon, but his first appearance wasn't especially memorable. Vati was used to designate Four Swords as something outside of mainline Zelda. Not a spin off per se, but definitely a side story. And that's not a knock. As we climb this list, some of the other side story villains have thrilled, intrigued, and even terrified. But the Vati of Four Swords is more of a one dimensional excuse to kick off the first multiplayer Zelda romp. Vati debuts when Zelda senses a disturbance in the forest at the never before mentioned Shrine of the Four Sword, and enlists her childhood friend Link to check it out. Upon their arrival, Vati jumps out of his hiding place and tells us he's ready to rage. He grabs up Princess Zelda, announces his intention to marry her, and whisks her away to his palace in the sky, where he waits and does nothing else until the very end of the game. The villainous marriage abduction trope is straight out of classical mythology, but it's also very Nintendo. That said, Vati doesn't have much motivation or characterization beyond, you know, being evil. His influence on the game world is also pretty much nil. The quote-unquote plot of Four Swords involves the Four Links collecting as many rupees as possible, which obviously was a design choice thought up to encourage backstabbing one another through the levels, but ostensibly is for the purpose of powering up three great fairies who will ultimately transport the Links to Vati's floating castle. I don't know why fairies in The Legend of Zelda always seem to be so hard up on cash, but one implication of the plot is that none of the terrestrial enemies in the game have anything to do with Vati. The Links eventually arrive at Vati's palace, which is notable for being the first wind or sky-themed dungeon in Zelda history. It's sort of surprising that this took nine games, given how prominent the theme becomes in later titles, but I do like that Vati has an original, well-defined identity as a wind-themed villain. Like the wind! Unlike other villains on this list, who spend their downtime checking in with the heroes or attempting to thwart their progress, Vati seems genuinely surprised that the Lynx bothered to follow him. Nevertheless, he's up for a fight, and it's not too bad. The first stage showcases his signature wind magic, and requires the Lynx to bring him down by hurling bombs into his destructive updrafts. The second and third stages involve some color-coded weed whacking and a cooperative riff on the classic Zelda tennis match. After three rounds, Vati goes down for the count and gets sucked back into the Four Sword. Of course, we all know the greater feat was rounding up enough Link Cables and friends to actually play the game. Number 17, Oracle of Seasons. The villain of Seasons is General Onyx, a beefy generic looking iron knuckle whose dastardly plot reaches Bond villain levels of absurdity. His scheme involves kidnapping Din, the Oracle of Seasons herself, and sinking the Temple of Seasons in order to plunge the weather of Holodrum into a state of chaos. But winter gave spring and summer a miss and went straight on into autumn. <sighs> That's pretty goofy, but Onyx also loses major villain clout for how downright innocuous the whole thing is. While the NPCs in Oracle of Ages are living in terror of Varen's rule, children in Oracle of Seasons are playing in the town square and having the time of their life. As you explore the rest of Holodrum, you'll encounter a woman snowed into her house, a Goron who has a cold, and a city flooded by melting snow. Although, that place is actually named Sunken City, so maybe this is a regular occurrence. Long story short, these are pretty low stakes for a Zelda game. Most other works that deal with climate and weather threats focus on winter, because it's the scariest season. There's a reason the ominous stark words aren't, spring is coming, and that disaster movies never deal with the threat of perpetual autumn. On the other hand, it's cool that you can actually see the effects of the villain's plot on the game world, something that was missing from the previous two games. Onyx himself only appears twice, once at the beginning when he kidnaps Din and imprisons her using the same rupee encasement technology that Ganondorf pioneered in Ocarina of Time, and once at the end when Link shows up to confront him. That's the whole plot. In order to save Holodrum and restore the Four Seasons, all Link has to do is rescue the dancing Oracle Din from Onyx's lair. Save the cheerleader, save the world! Along the way, Link acquires the Rod of Seasons, which seems to pretty much solve the weather problem, but still rescues Din as a professional courtesy. The boss fight with Onyx happens in two stages. In the first, he uses Din as a human shield, and Link must bat her away with the Rod of Seasons before landing a sword spin. In the second phase, there's a major twist. After collapsing his base, General Onyx reveals that he's actually a dragon. 
This is completely out of left field and very silly, but the fight itself is cool if challenging. If you're playing a linked game, it's revealed at this point that Onyx was just a pawn working for Twin Rova to revive Ganon. This makes Oracle of Seasons one of nine Zelda games with a plot to revive or restore a major villain, and the first of eight where that plot is successful. Technically, this means that Ganon and Twin Rova are the final villains of the game, which only further undermines Onyx's agency as a villain. Apparently, Onyx's job was to cause enough destruction in Holodrum to light the Flame of Destruction, one of three flames needed to revive Ganon. Holodrum doesn't seem all that destroyed, if you ask me, but I guess he did enough to drag it over the line. It all adds up to a rote villain with no personality and no initiative to hack it as a solo lead. Don't flatter yourself. You were never even a player. Number 16. The Legend of Zelda. Initially, I wanted to rank this one higher, but I tried to check my nostalgia at the door. The first game gets points for kicking off some series-defining archetypes, but the story is just so paper-thin. And actually, I mean that literally. Except for this in-game blurb, which hadn't yet decided the correct spelling of Ganon's name, any characterization or backstory is found in the game manual. Ganon's first appearance shared many of the features we've come to expect from Link's greatest foe, but also displayed some characteristics that were later dropped and seem weird in retrospect. Between his red cloak and pale skin, a love of darkness, an aversion to crosses, and a weakness to silver projectiles, early Legend of Zelda Ganon gives off definite vampire vibes. Ganon is motivated purely by a thirst for power, and his kidnapping of Princess Zelda in this game is just completely instrumental. She has the Triforce of Wisdom, and he wants it. As the manual puts it, he's real mean. Just before Zelda is kidnapped, she breaks the Triforce of Wisdom into eight parts and sends them into hiding, along with her trusty servant Impa, who carries a message from the princess requesting help. Help me, Link. Link's task in the game is to recover the eight parts in order to enter Death Mountain and face off with Ganon, fighting Triforce with Triforce. However, the fact that Zelda is the one who hid the Triforce creates some plot confusion. We don't know if the enemies in the dungeon are guarding the Triforce on behalf of the princess, or if they're minions of Ganon keeping the Triforce from Link. If they are minions of Ganon, it's not clear why the bosses don't just turn around, grab the Triforce in the adjoining room, and deliver it to their master. Either way, the Legend of Zelda gets credit for standardizing several villainous tropes that have since become series staples, like a dark lord who wields the Triforce of Power, a kidnapped princess, and a quest to claim powerful magical artifacts that are required to bring down the big bad guy. It's crazy to me how games from the 80s that never even glimpsed the storytelling potential of the medium became the basis for these vastly detailed cultural mythologies, but I guess it speaks to the power of nostalgia. It is neat to see how each new iteration retells the Legend of Zelda, even if the original was pretty basic. Number 15, Triforce Heroes. This is a fun one. The story of Triforce Heroes doesn't get a lot of love, but I think that's a shame. The game's setting is Hytopia, a little kingdom obsessed with fashion, which is ruled by the jovial King Tuft and his fashionable daughter, Princess Styla. Breaking our run of generic evil overlords, the antagonist this time is Lady Maud, or simply the Lady, a fashion designer with a flair for the villainous. In the proud tradition of Disney princess villains, Lady Maud lives on the margins of society and is super jealous of the princess, in this case because everyone admires her, quote, unbearably cute fashion sense. She also seems to genuinely disapprove of Princess Styla's wardrobe, and one day she hatches a plan to sabotage the posh princess. I would like to make one small change. When Princess Styla opens a mysterious, unmarked package, she's suddenly cursed to wear an unbelievably ugly outfit that cannot be removed. So essentially, Lady Maud is a fashion unabomber, except her entire manifesto is like a Michael Kors roast of a Project Runway contestant. In the wake of the Lady's curse, the citizens of Hytopia begin to dress unfashionably, for fear of being cursed themselves. An aristocrat called the Bearded Baron cuts his suit in half to avoid seeming stylish, and Princess Styla hides in her room so as not to be seen in such an unflattering outfit. A distressed King Tuft offers a reward to any heroes willing to break the curse, at which point Link and his two identical companions enter the story. We soon learn that Lady Maud is the sister of Madame Couture, Hytopia's resident designer and the Glinda to Lady Maud's Elphaba. The two sisters were members of a tribe that specialized in magical clothing design, but while Madame Couture's sense of style was acclaimed by the people of Hytopia, the lady's designs never received the recognition she craved, and she relocated to the surrounding Drablands, where she now designs outfits for monsters. We also learn that the curse can be broken by gathering a few of Lady Maud's accessories and crafting the Lady's Ensemble. The Lynx fight fashion with fashion, 
enlisting Madame Couture to create a line of increasingly stylish and powerful magical outfits. This is a hobo suit, darling. Oh, you can't be seen in this. I won't allow it. The Lynx hunt the Lady of the Drablands, which is the main meat of the game and involves completing fairly standard but well-designed Zelda dungeons. In a first for this list, Lady Maud makes an appearance about halfway through the game, which keeps her involved in the story. When the heroes arrive at her hideout and politely ask her to lift the curse on Princess Styla, Lady Maud is offended that everyone considers her outfit to be a curse, and flees after insulting the heroes for not recognizing her fashion genius. It's not clear that Lady Maud's intentions are evil, but nevertheless there's a curse to be broken and the Lynx pursue her to a temple in the sky to claim the last of the Lady's materials. I like that each stage of the final boss fight is a costume change, and I like that the main mechanic of the battle is coordinating colors with the Lady's accessories, even if managing the totem mechanic is clunky and annoying. Lady Maud is appalled that she could lose to such plebes, and she condemns the heroes to a life of living unfashionably ever after. After snatching the final piece of the ladies' ensemble, the three heroes are able to make it work and craft a garment that finally breaks the curse on Princess Styla. Apart from having her scheme foiled, Lady Maud is unique in the Zelda canon for receiving no comeuppance of any kind. The king even comments that he won't press charges because the Lynx successfully reversed the curse. It's implied that she gets on with her life in the Drablands, and the cursed tights simply become another piece in her portfolio. Ultimately, Triforce Heroes is a quirky side quest in the Zelda mythos but Lady Maud perfectly fits the scope and style of the game. Number 14, Phantom Hourglass. Phantom Hourglass is another game that bucks the trend of a Dark Lord rising. The game's antagonist is Bellum, a large and ancient squid creature with the parasitic tendencies of a life-sucking plant monster, but we don't know he exists until a good chunk of the way through the game. Our first tangle with villainy is the sudden appearance of a ghost ship, which magically kidnaps Tetra and disappears into the mists, kicking off the adventure. My feeling is that the writing staff were tossing ideas around and couldn't decide between a ghost ship and a tentacly sea monster, so they decided to do both. The ghost ship, it turns out, is a projection created by Bellum to lure travelers into his territory, where he can consume their life force. It sort of operates like the glowy, dangly thing on the end of an anglerfish, which is fitting because Bellum is less evil per se and more of a deep sea predator with convoluted methods of satisfying his carnivorous urges. Bellum has the dubious distinction of being the only primary villain in the series with zero lines of dialogue, which fits his eldritch abomination sea monster vibe, but doesn't make for a villain with discernible motivations or an interesting personality. I actually like the concept of Link doing battle with a straight up kraken, because it fits the theme of a seafaring adventure and it's something different for the series, but like most mute monsters, Bellum only becomes less interesting after the villainous reveal. Bellum is not a looming presence in the game. He mostly appears as the subject of sailors' songs and old wives' tales, which is fitting I guess, but most of the problems facing the various islands in the game have nothing to do with the game's villain. His interest in Tetra is purely down to her large quantity of life force, so in that sense the stakes are pretty impersonal. Oceus, the wise old man who turns out to be a giant whale deity called the Ocean King, is the only one with any actual connection to Bellum. Before the events of the game, Bellum attacked Oceus and trapped him in the Temple of the Ocean King, which was cursed to drain the life of all who enter. He also made the Phantoms, in order to deter would-be intruders with overly long stealth sections. Oceus was drained of power, but managed to create a human projection of himself, and that projection enlists Link to take down Bellum once and for all. The Astral Projection Grandpa plot is pretty convoluted, but the antagonism between Bellum and Oceus is based on real-life enmity between squids and sperm whales, which is neat. Eventually, Link manages to forge the Phantom Sword, which can damage Bellum and grants immunity to the life-draining curse on the Temple of the Ocean King. With it, he ventures into the depths of the temple and challenges Bellum. After a few rounds, Bellum decides to take to the sea, at which point Link climbs aboard the SS Lineback and broadsides the ghost ship until it goes down in flames. Link and Linebeck board the wreckage, and Linebeck shows some genuine character development before Bellum uses Constrict and turns him into a mind-controlled phantom. Using the time-stopping power of the Phantom Sword, Link gets the drop on Bellum, delivers the final blow, and finally reunites with Tetra. I like that the final battle echoes the opening scene, with Link and Tetra on the ghost ship, but it says something about the villain that Linebeck is the most memorable part of the final fight. Phantom Hourglass shines when it comes to exploration and cartography, single room puzzles, and one of the very best companions in the series, but it falls flat in the villain department. Number 13, Four Swords Adventures. 
This might be generous, because Four Swords Adventures is not a deep game, but the GameCube entry of the Four Swords trilogy features the most iconic trio of Zelda villains out of any game on the list. Ganondorf, Vati, and Dark Link. Four Swords Adventures is a real Frankenstein of a game. The aesthetic borrows extensively from A Link to the Past, with Wind Waker effects and character design layered on top. The plot, too, is a tangled mishmash of Zelda tropes, from magical maidens and rainbow bridges to twilight mirrors and alternate dimensions. Allegedly, the plot of Four Swords Adventures could have been even more complicated, but Miyamoto demanded that the dev team cut plot elements and focus more on gameplay. But despite all that, it's one of those games you can play through without paying any attention to the story, especially if you play with friends. FSA begins identically to the original Four Swords, with Link and Zelda visiting the Shrine of the Four Sword. This time, though, Dark Link shows up and releases Vati. Vati's role in the game is to fly around causing chaos and distracting the heroes from Ganon, making him little more than a puppet villain and an excuse to bring the Four Sword into the plot. Frankly, Nintendo did him dirty here. Instead of taking the chance to explore an interesting side villain who was back for round two, they propped him up as a red herring for their main man and basically hung him out to dry. Of more interest is Dark Link, or Shadow Link, who appears in the game as an evil reflection of normal Link. Mega Scott. According to the Hyrule Historia, Shadow Link is a manifestation of Ganondorf's hatred for Link, which makes no sense, but whatever. Shadow Link reminds me of Bowser Jr. in Super Mario Sunshine, when he's running around disguised as Mario and causing all sorts of mischief on Isle Delfino. Shadow Link likewise dogs the heroes at every turn, summoning clones, setting fires, and occasionally dropping comically large bombs, all while framing Link for his misdeeds. There's kind of a mystery element in play, as the Links investigate the origins of Dark Link and slowly uncover a deeper threat. Of course, it wouldn't be a Zelda game if that threat didn't turn out to be the one and only Prince of Darkness, Ganondorf. Once you become aware of Ganon's presence, Four Swords Adventures starts to feel like a Carmen Sandiego game, where you keep showing up at locations only to discover that the villain has just left. This goes on for about half the game, with the Links arriving slightly too late to the crime scenes of a stolen mirror and a stolen trident. Along the way, Ganon is the subject of many an NPC's flavor text, from Deku Scrubs who worship the Dark Lord, to Gerudo who consider him a black sheep. My personal favorite is a member of the Zuna tribe, who complains that Ganondorf is a jerk for not waving as he rode by. A scathing indictment indeed. As you might expect, the three villains are dispatched in ascending power order. Dark Link hardly merits a boss battle before Zelda unplugs the mirror and shuts him down for good. Vati's boss fight is arguably less interesting than his original in Four Swords, involving only the bombing phase and a few human cannonball maneuvers. He does, however, turn out to be vital to the structural integrity of his base, forcing the Lynx to escort Zelda through a collapsing tower a la Ocarina of Time before facing off with Ganon. Ganon brags about his shiny new trident and tosses it around like a boomerang, before ultimately losing to the Lynx squad and being sealed in the Four Sword by Zelda and the other Maidens. Four Swords Adventures isn't blazing any new trails, but it's a fun celebration of Zelda villains and storylines. Number 12, Link's Awakening. This was probably the hardest game to rank. On the one hand, the villainous plot is dark, creepy, and thought-provoking, and the game makes you question whether defeating the final boss is even the right thing to do. That's cool. On the other hand, there's no primary antagonist, no threat that Link must prevent, and the villains arguably aren't even evil, or, you know, real. Plus, the game unfolds more like a mystery than an adventure, which is great, but it means that the villains are mostly kept in obscurity, and are ultimately overshadowed by the game's big reveal. Link's Awakening begins with, well, exactly that. Link wakes up on a mysterious island and soon learns that something is amiss. Did anybody see that? It's ultimately revealed that Link has been pulled into a dream world, being imagined by a giant marine creature called the Windfish. The villains this time are nightmares, bent on conquering the dream world and preventing the windfish from waking up. Seemingly, this second goal is motivated by self-preservation, because the nightmares, and everything else, will cease to be if the windfish wakes up. According to the creators, Link's Awakening drew inspiration from Twin Peaks, and a strange small town is indeed central to the story. Getting to know Mabe Village builds an emotional attachment to the dream world, and no resident better exemplifies that connection than Marin, the girl who finds Link unconscious on the beach. Link's growing relationship with Marin is the moral crux of the game, because waking the windfish will free Link from the dream, but it will also snuff Marin out of existence. It's common knowledge now, but the dream twist was only gradually hinted at during the game. At one point, Link discovers an ancient ruin with a cryptic wall painting that accurately describes the nature of the dream world, but the owl suggests that no one knows for sure if it's the truth. 
The most explicit hints come from the nightmares themselves, but seeing as they're the villains, it's not known if this information is reliable either. As Link gathers the instruments needed to wake the windfish, the monsters of Koholand Island grow more and more restless. They sense the foreign nature of the dreamer. They attack like white blood cells fighting an infection. The dungeon bosses make increasingly desperate pleas for Link to stop what he's doing, with Facade in particular warning hysterically that everything on the island will disappear forever if Link persists. I'm sure there's a YouTube video out there arguing that Link is the true villain of the game, because his actions ultimately result in the total destruction of Koholand Island. But at this point in the game, it wasn't totally clear if the nightmares were telling the truth. Eventually, Link does wake the windfish, and faces off with the chief nightmare inside the windfish egg. Or at least I dreamt I did. The nightmares take several forms, including those of Aghanim and Ganon from Link to the Past, which is relevant because this is the same Link from that game. I appreciate the implication that Link is suffering from PTSD nightmares about Aghanim and Ganon, and maybe this whole game is about facing your nightmares and finding peace. Or maybe it's about waking up in the morning while your inner demons constantly hit the snooze button. In the end, Link defeats the Nightmare and wakes up on the wreckage of his ship, which confirms that the adventure was, in fact, a dream. Or was it? Number 11, A Link to the Past. Link to the Past is the third game in the series, and the first to introduce a new villain, the wizard priest Agadim. Ganon is now a distant memory, having been sealed away in the Dark World generations ago. And between the introduction of a brand new villain and explicit assurances from the manual, one thing we know for sure is that Ganon won't be escaping that place. Yeah, A Link to the Past pretty much wrote the script for the Ganon was behind it all along twist. In fact, this game along with Ocarina of Time codified most of Ganondorf's attributes and backstory. Ganon's trident? Check. The Master Sword? Check. Dead Man's Volley, Ganon's theme music, Seven Sages Who Guard the Sacred Realm, a puppet villain who releases Ganon from the Dark World, all of that started here. The full backstory describes Ganondorf as a desert-dwelling king of thieves who uses black magic to enter the Sacred Realm in search of a powerful golden relic. The hand of Midas. In the Sacred Realm, Ganondorf slays all of his followers and claims the Triforce. Using its power, he becomes Ganon, raises an army, and assaults the Kingdom of Hyrule. But there were some who resisted. The Free Peoples of Hyrule rise up in an event called the Imprisoning War and seal Ganondorf away in the Sacred Realm, which is now known as the Dark World. Generations later, Hyrule is afflicted by strange plagues when a mysterious wizard called Aghanim shows up and uses magic to save the kingdom. Turns out, he was behind the plagues all along and was using magic trickery in order to seem heroic and wiggle into the king's good graces. But, but he saved me and Buddy's lives. No, he's been faking the whole thing with illusion tech. Yeah, he's using these like hologram projectors. Whoa, that's... Crazy. Using his newfound position, Aghanim kills the King of Hyrule, kidnaps the descendants of the Seven Sages, and begins conducting magical experiments with the goal of releasing Ganon from the Dark World. This is where the game begins. One night, for unexplained reasons, Link and his uncle receive a telepathic message from Princess Zelda, who is being held in the castle dungeon. The pair set out for the castle, but in a surprisingly dark turn of events, Link's uncle is killed almost immediately by the castle guard. Oh well, says Link, embarking on a quest to prove his courage and acquire the Master Sword. Meanwhile, Aghanim is active in the background. He puts out an APB on Link and sends the castle guard to recapture Zelda. When Link shows up to confront him, it's too late and Aghanim uses Zelda to open a portal to the Dark World. Aghanim is the first Zelda villain to be fought twice, and this first encounter established the series trope of a Disc 1 boss fight, plot twist, and difficulty spike. Fighting the villain early in the game makes him a more concrete antagonist, and having Link fail to halt the villain's scheme drives up the stakes for the second half of the plot. We'll see this more and more in the top half of the list. After traveling around the Dark World and rescuing the Seven Maidens, Link climbs Ganon's tower and fights Aghanim again. It's similar to the first fight, with rounds of Dead Man's Volley, decoy clones, and an occasional unblockable lightning attack. Notably, A Link to the Past featured the first puzzle bosses that had to be figured out rather than simply beaten down. After his defeat, Aghanim's body crumples and Ganon's spirit emerges. I think this is supposed to mean that Aghanim was merely a projection alternate form of Ganon, but it's not totally clear. The final showdown with Ganon is probably the most epic boss fight on the list so far. The music is sick, the stakes are high, and the fight involves multiple rounds and changing strategies. It's also the moment that Ganon established himself as more than a one-off villain. 
Overall, the story of Link to the Past isn't the most memorable, but it was the first foray into genuine storytelling and world building, and it paved the way for future games to hit even higher heights. Plus, Link to the Past will be remembered as the one and only time that Ganon pulling the strings was an original twist. Number 10. Breath of the Wild Breath of the Wild is a truly excellent game, but it's not known for its story or its villain. The villain this time around is Calamity Ganon, who apparently is even Ganondorf's final form. Calamity Ganon must have given up his personality and his corporeal form around the same time, because he's completely incapable of speech. Accounts differ as to Ganon's intelligence. Some NPCs describe him as more of an animalistic force, but the King of Hyrule says, Ganon was cunning. At the start of the game, Link wakes up with amnesia and only gradually begins to recover his memories, so we learn the story piecemeal in the form of flashbacks. A hundred years earlier, the people of Hyrule began to be concerned about a prophecy predicting the return of the legendary Ganon. In accordance with the prophecy, they dug up a bunch of ancient technology and appointed champions from four prominent races to pilot the newly excavated mechs. Link is chosen to wield the Master Sword, and Zelda is supposed to have these fantastical magical powers, but that's not really working out so much. After several failed attempts to awaken Zelda's power, Ganon activates his trap card and seizes control of all the ancient automatons. The four champions are killed, and Link himself falls in battle with a guardian, leaving Zelda to face Ganon alone. Luckily, her powers finally appear, and she traps both Ganon and herself inside Hyrule Castle. You have power! <laughs> yeah, baby! Link was supposed to be the one to face Ganon, but when the world needed him most, he vanished. A hundred years passed, and Link wakes up in the Shrine of Resurrection, ready for a second shot at Calamity Ganon. And this time, he's not going down so easily. I will wake up stronger than ever because I will have used that time to figure out exactly why I died and what moves I could have used to defend myself better now that I know what hold he had me in. Breath of the Wild may not be plot heavy, but I give it credit for understanding exactly what it wants to do. After you clear the Great Plateau, the King of Hyrule briefly summarizes the plot and two simple words flash across the screen. Destroy Ganon. That moment gave me chills. It's primal, it's archetypal, and it's exactly how I wanted the series to present a game about Ganon. No last second bait and switch, no convoluted red herrings, just a no-holds-barred showdown between good and evil. All you technically have to do to complete the game is wrap up the Great Plateau, sprint to Hyrule Castle, and somehow manage to dispatch Ganon. But if you play the game like a normal person, you'll travel around Hyrule, completing quests, getting stronger, and gathering allies. In that sense, the whole game is like one long training montage before the big fight. Impa even suggests that you don't face Ganon until you're ready. And after all, a few weeks or months of preparation are drops in the bucket after sleeping for a hundred years. This premise helps avoid the usual narrative dissonance that results from Link golfing, snowboarding, and investing in real estate while the big bad looms. If Breath of the Wild has a major theme, it's failure. The King of Hyrule failed to protect his kingdom, and Link failed to protect Zelda, and Zelda failed to harness her magical power in time. Everywhere you go, the various people groups are all reckoning with their failure to stop Calamity Ganon a hundred years earlier and the four dead champions each have stories of personal failure. Each of the champions was killed by an aspect of Calamity Ganon, and if Link defeats Wind Blight, Water Blight, Fire Blight, and Thunder Blight Ganon, he can regain control of their Divine Beasts and begin to put right what once went wrong. If you take back the Divine Beasts and avenge the four champions, their ghosts will appear in a cutscene just before the final confrontation. But unlike some other fictional ghosts who merely provide moral support, these blast Ganon with giant lasers and reduce his health by half. Now my moment has finally come. Brace yourself, Ganon, for the sting of my revenge! One thing that Breath of the Wild gets absolutely right is the pure spectacle of Calamity Ganon. From most points on the map, you can see his malice pig form swirling around Hyrule Castle. The castle itself is a dark labyrinth with a baller soundtrack that builds in intensity as you climb to the Inner Sanctum. And Calamity Ganon is a tangled mess of Guardian parts, malice, and original Ganon bits. Also, I've never paid much attention to this in other Zelda games, but the sound mixing on Ganon is really good. The final face-off with Dark Beast Ganon and Hyrule Field is extremely easy, but again, the visuals and the soundtrack are super cool. Link and Zelda team up to bring Ganon down, and eventually Zelda finishes him off with a powerful blast of light. Boss fights aren't really what Breath of the Wild is all about, but it's a satisfying conclusion to an epic adventure. Number 9. The Minish Cap this is the first game on the list to feature an honest-to-god origin story, and that rules. All the other villains have just sort of been there, or were back for their umpteenth reincarnation, but Minish Cap is a true prequel. It explains the origin of Vati and the Four Sword, both of which we encountered in the Four Swords games. 
And even though Vati spent both of those games as a one-eyed wind monster, practically all fan art since Minish Cap depicts him as a brooding Minish Mage with emo swoop hair. This is also the first game on the list where Link's companion has personal beef with the villain. This is a big Zelda trend, and it makes sense because the companion's backstory does double duty to provide a personal connection with the villain, and Link himself is such a blank slate that it's hard to make him the anchor of those character beats. Ezlo, the companion this time, is a master magical craftsman of the Minish, who took Vati in as a young boy and trained him in the magical arts. A good part of Vati's motivation is a desire to surpass his old master, which is both relatably humanizing and delightfully petty. When I left you, I was but the learner. Now I am the master. Yeah! Ezlo's big project is a magic wishing cap that grants the wishes of the wearer, which he plans to present as a gift to humans on the day the portal opens between the human and Minish worlds. Vati seems to resent giving away Minish treasures, as well as Ezlo's authority, and one day he steals the wishing cap and wishes to become a powerful sorcerer. He leaves the workshop and, just for good measure, turns Ezlo into a talking hat. Ah, right then. If the events of the game are any guide, this is probably because Ezlo is constantly chiming in with condescending squawks of advice. Having humiliated his mentor and stolen significant magical powers, Vati steps through the portal and enters the human world. There, he sets out to reclaim another Minish creation, the Light Force, and become the most powerful being alive. Vati is vain, childish, and arrogant, and the fact that I can tell you these traits shows how far we've come from the one-dimensional villains on the early part of this list. He's also an active antagonist. As I made this list, I realized that Zelda villains can be divided into two main types. Those who do a single bad thing, and those who embark on a parallel quest of their own. Vati is the latter. We don't encounter Vati much during the game, which is one reason Minish Cap isn't ranked higher, but we are made aware that he's taking steps to hunt down the Light Force while Link and Ezlo are working to forge the Four Sword. He impersonates the King of Hyrule and orders the Castle Guard to search for information about the Light Force. At one point, he shows up in person to taunt Ezlo and send monsters after Link, but primarily Minish Cap keeps him visible by featuring little cutscenes that take place after key plot points. At the time of release, Minish Cap was the earliest game in the Zelda timeline, and the three Minish artifacts sort of function like precursors to the Triforce. The Mage's Cap symbolizes power, the Four Sword is courage, and the Light Force, which is contained in Princess Zelda, represents wisdom. Vati himself is like a proto-Ganondorf. He's a power-hungry sorcerer from a foreign land who comes to Hyrule, seizes control of the kingdom, hunts for the other magical relics, and eventually transforms himself into an eldritch abomination, Dark Lord. And much like Ganondorf, Vati's fatal flaw is underestimating the courage third of the power trio. Vati initially thinks that the Light Force is a physical object, and expects to find it in the bound chest, which instead contains nothing but monsters and the broken Picori sword. In his arrogance, Vati dismisses the weapon that will be his eventual downfall as nothing more than a useless relic. No more than a broken head. Eventually, Vati decides the best way to uncover the Light Force is to allow Link and Ezlo to fully forge the Four Sword, again showing his prideful disregard for the Minish weapon. However, this plan works, and Vati uses Link to discover a hidden room in the castle, where an ancient stained glass window reveals the true location of the Light Force. This reveal sets the climax of the plot in motion. Vati immediately begins to extract the Light Force from Zelda, and Link must infiltrate the magically transformed Dark Hyrule Castle and stop the ceremony before it's too late. And unlike most games where the so-called timer is really a scripted event, you can actually lose. If you don't rescue Zelda in time, the ritual just ends and Vati becomes all-powerful. I am the golden god of this place! I reign supreme! I! I! But assuming you don't dawdle too long, Vati assumes three more forms, including his familiar Wind Mage appearance, and the resulting clash is suitably epic. Link uses the fully powered Four Sword to split himself and vanquish Vati, which sets the stage for the rest of the Four Swords trilogy. Ultimately, Minish Cap does what a good origin story should do. It makes me care more about Vati's original games. Number 8. Spirit Tracks I like to imagine the pitch meeting where an actual Nintendo employee walks in, shuffles his notes, and says, You guys know how we always do that thing where a quirky one-off villain is trying to revive a Dark Lord? Yeah, well, what if we do that, but this time the Dark Lord is a train? That's the ridiculous premise of Spirit Tracks, but somehow it works. Spirit Tracks features a villainous triumvirate, Maladus, the aforementioned demon train lord, 
Cole, a simpering evil chancellor who desires nothing more than to unleash Maladus on the world, and Byrne, a mysterious enforcer with a mechanical arm and a thirst for power. Cole is the first one we meet, and he wears two hats. He's both an impatient advisor slash chancellor to Princess Zelda, and a vicious backstabbing schemer. He's also literally wearing two hats, in a bid to disguise his horned appearance. You might think that the mustache, eyebrows, and the title of Chancellor were already a dead giveaway, but apparently the people of New Hyrule need to see actual demon horns before they realize someone is evil. Cole's right-hand man, Byrne, used to be a member of the Locomo, the trained people guardians who worship the spirits of good, which we learn when Anne Jean, the wise old train lady, is all like, who was a pupil of mine until he turned to evil, and I had a pupil once who had no interest in learning discipline, and also, I'm rebuilding a turn-of-the-century steam engine. But apart from the synergistic train-themed naming, a train burns coal, get it? Cole and Byrne make an odd couple, and initially seem more comical than threatening. Byrne appears at first to be a run-of-the-mill bodyguard, and Cole looks like he just got done chastising some kids for coveting his lucky charms. However, any silliness evaporates quickly when the duo knocks out your mentor, destroys your train, and straight up murders Princess Zelda. I like this part because A, we actually spent time getting to know Alfonso and Zelda before anything bad happened to them, so we care when it does, and B, it means that this Link has personal beef with the villains. Because this time, it's personnel. Cole and Byrne's plot involves using Zelda's body to break the seal on Maladus, which begins to manifest physically in erasing train tracks across the land. I always thought the idea of train tracks acting as chains was a cool concept, and it meshes with gameplay as Link tries to restore the train network and reconnect the various locales of New Hyrule. Most of the game involves Link and Ghost Zelda scrambling to stop the revival of Maladus and reclaim Zelda's body before it can be used as a vessel for the Demon King. But in true Zelda fashion, it's impossible to stop the villains in the revival stage. The best thing about Spirit Tracks is that each villain gets a distinct and unique ending that fits his character. Burn is up first, and you'd be forgiven for thinking that the game is nearly over when you face him, but oh how wrong you'd be. Burn can't believe he was defeated by two human children, but Link and Zelda chalk it up to the power of friendship and teamwork, a fitting rebuttal to the man who betrayed his tribe and struck out on his own. The battle bought time for Cole to revive Maladus, but shortly thereafter, the master and servant pair betray and attack Byrne, revealing that they never considered him more than a disgusting pawn in their evil game. A newly humbled Byrne recuperates aboard the spirit train, and decides to join forces with Link, Zelda, and his old teacher Anjean. After several more unexpected hours of gameplay, boy does this game drag, Link and Zelda travel to the Dark Realm and engage in a Pac-Man-esque showdown with a squad of ghost trains. This part is really irritating because it's long, and if you make one mistake, you have to start over completely. Eventually, you catch up with the demon train and climb aboard after yet another drawn out battle. 007, are you all right? Just changing carriages. The train top showdown with Cole is a tedious escort mission in which Link contends with ghost rats and clunky controls. After <clears throat> a long effort, Link and Zelda reach the front of the train and force Maladus out of Zelda's body. Come out, get out, get out, come out of Sus chest, come out, come out, come out, you spirits. At first, Zelda is unable to reclaim her body, and it seems that Maladus is about to consume our heroes. But in a final act of redemption, a still injured Burn appears and uses his power to hold Maladus at bay. Zelda finally reunites with her body, but Burn's redemption arc comes to a violent end as he's killed by Maladus. Maladus still needs a host body, and with Zelda off the table, he sets his sights on the simpering sycophant Cole. It takes a minute for Cole to realize where this is headed, but what happens next is pure nightmare fuel. As Maladus engulfs his prey, Cole's screams are genuinely haunting. But hey, he finally found his master a host. Only the mustachioed, bestial Maladus Cole hybrid remains. He's just, like, evil, so, you know, the heroes have to put him in the ground. Which, after a long battle, they do. In a cool callback to their Wind Waker ancestors, Link and Zelda finish Maladus by driving the Locomo Sword into his skull, just like Link did to Ganon in that game. Stay tuned for that gruesome and glorious moment, it's coming later in the video. With Maladus defeated, the watchful Locomo ascend to train heaven, and peace returns to new Hyrule. Spirit Tracks is really just a so-so game, and is most remembered for a multitude of tedious mechanics, but the three villains are surprisingly dark and well fleshed out. Number 7, Oracle of Ages. You can decide if this is down to my personal preference or if it's just Nintendo's wheelhouse, 
but four of the seven remaining games are deeply concerned with time travel. The two Oracle games are roughly equal in terms of gameplay, but Ages is the darker, cooler big sister in just about every other respect. The villain is Varen, a sinister sorceress who uses trickery, persuasion, and planning to achieve her goals. Her main talent is the ability to possess the people around her, which she uses to great effect over the course of the game. Varen's establishing moment is a real mic drop. At the behest of Impa, Link moves aside a sacred barrier and enters the protected woods where Nehru is hiding. There, Impa's body crumples and Varen emerges, revealing that she possessed Impa in order to trick Link and infiltrate Nehru's hiding place. Before anyone can say boo, Varen possesses the Oracle of Ages, which introduces the central problem of the game. Neither Link nor Nehru's childhood friend Ralph are sure how to attack Varen without harming Nehru. While they hesitate, Varen uses Nehru's time powers to open a portal to the distant past and promises to usher in an age of darkness. And sure enough, as soon as she enters the portal, the present is altered. Young men become old men, villagers are wiped from existence, and history takes a dark turn. Prior to this point in time, somewhere in the past, the timeline skewed into this tangent, creating an alternate 1985. Link and Ralph journey to the past, where they each pursue different methods of rescuing Nehru. Link acquires the Harp of Ages, which allows him to travel back and forth through time, but Ralph chooses Squirtle and says he'll smell you later. In the past, Varen has become the chief advisor to Ambi, the Queen of Labrina, and manipulates her into constructing a massive black tower, which looms over all of Labrina. Varen uses her stolen powers to make time stand still and force the residents of Lina Village to work around the clock, while Ambi's soldiers kidnap villagers Gestapo-style and bring them to work on the tower. Over the course of the game, the tower's progress is shown to indicate ever-climbing stakes, and Varen warns that the completed tower will not only grant her more power, but usher in an even greater threat. One thing I like about Varen is that she isn't overcome by brute force or even the clever use of items, but rather by learning her secret weakness. Varen's kryptonite, and the one substance that can drive her out of a host's body, is the aptly named Mystery Seed, and in a defensive move, she has Queen Ambi order the castle guards to find and destroy all such seeds. Although Link is not present during this cutscene, it serves as the vital clue to Varen's weakness, and Link is able to stock up before infiltrating Ambi's palace and confronting the possessed Nehru. Using a combination of the mystery seeds and the switch hook, Link is able to perform a combat exorcism and attack Varen directly. But given that this battle takes place about two-thirds of the way through the game, it's not surprising that Varen has another trick up her sleeve. After Link expels the villainess from Nehru, Ambi enters the room and Varen's spirit attaches itself to the queen. In place of a dark lord, you would have a queen! Not dark, but beautiful and terrible as the dawn! Treacherous as the sea! This is a good twist, and it shows Varen's adaptability. Nehru teleports herself and Link back to the present to avoid the palace guard, and Varen remains in the past, continuing work on the Black Tower and now in full command of the kingdom. She places a powerful magical illusion on the entrance to the Black Tower, but Link teams up with the Mako Tree and secretly begins to gather the eight essences of time, which can dispel the illusion. Throughout the game, the effects of Varen's historical rewrite are everywhere, and include a royal Zora lineage ended by plague, a catastrophic volcanic eruption, and moblins who are sent Terminator-style to assassinate a young Mako Tree. Link is able to right many of these wrongs, and eventually climbs the Black Tower for a second showdown with Varen, with Ralph joining at the last second. At this point, Varen plays her trump card and reveals that Ralph is the great-great-great-great-grandson of Queen Ambi, meaning that Ambi's death will result in Ralph being erased from existence. That's heavy, but luckily Link came prepared, and also doesn't care. By now, Mystery Seed exorcisms are old hat, but the battle does require a few tricky shots from the Seed Shooter. After Ambi is freed from Varen's control, Varen makes a desperate attempt to possess Link, but he backflips away which is apparently all it takes to ward off demonic possession in this universe. A pissed off Varen reveals her true form, a fairy with a dopey grin, and uses shadow magic to summon dark links. Over the course of the final battle, Varen transforms into a beetle, a bee, and a spider, all while complaining that she's being forced to use such ugly forms. But eventually Link prevails. As in Oracle of Seasons, Varen's defeat leads to the linked ending with Ganon and Twin Rova, but Varen goes out with far more personality and self-respect than Onyx, promising to haunt Link after her death. For a spin-off villain in a handheld game, she leaves a big impression. Number 6. Twilight Princess We're finally getting to the real heavy hitters, but Twilight Princess just misses the top 5. You can tell they were trying so hard to make this the most epic Zelda ever, and to some degree that ambition paid off. 
Zant is the villain this time, and he's coming in hot after an unexpected rise to power. Zant was in line to claim the throne of the Twilight Realm, but was passed over in favor of the Twilight Princess and best character in the game, Midna. However, Zant makes a near-literal deal with the devil and uses the power of his newfound god to usurp the throne and curse Midna, turning her into an imp and banishing her from the kingdom. He then transforms the other Twilight into deadly beasts and invades Hyrule, cloaking the land in a veil of semi-darkness. In his first on-screen appearance, he swaggers into the throne room with an entourage of Twilight Beasts and intimidates Zelda into an immediate surrender, trapping her in the castle. Link is swept up in the story when a Moblin raiding party kidnaps the entire youth population of his hometown, although what this has to do with Xant is not clear. Shortly thereafter, Link is sucked into the expanding Twilight Realm and transforms into a wolf, because Aonoma had a dream where the same thing happened to him. In wolf form, Link meets Midna, and the two form a tentative alliance. Link is keen to rescue the children of his village, and Midna has her sights set on breaking Zant's curse and reclaiming her throne. And I will take what is mine! With fire and blood, I will take it! Together they hunt down the fused shadows, which are powerful ancient artifacts that Midna plans to use against Zant. At one point, Zant shows up and uses a magic sword to reanimate a massive dinosaur skeleton, and at another, he chats with Midna about his new powers, and calls her a traitor for teaming up with a light worlder, before cursing Link and attempting to murder Midna by exposing her to a light spirit. Eventually, Link and Midna storm the Palace of Twilight, which Zant has vainly guarded with enemies resembling his own head. When they reach the throne room, which frankly should have been the climax of the game, Zant removes his helmet and reveals his true nature. He has a lot of issues, and he's stupid. Zant goes completely bonkers, brags about his god, and throws a wild tantrum before launching a bizarre battle which doubles as a whirlwind redux of earlier boss fights. At various points, he falls flat on his face, hops around with a stubbed toe, and flails his arms like a headless chicken, which pretty quickly reduces him to a pathetic and comical presence. Afterwards, Midna uses the fused shadows and literally explodes Zant like a balloon. It's such a sudden left turn for Zant's characterization that it really feels like they sacrificed his character for the sake of a twist. A big part of Zant's motivation was resentment at being passed over for the throne, and initially it was implied that this was due to violent ambition and a fascination with forbidden magic. But after this scene, it's pretty obvious the guy couldn't pass a basic sanity check. The big twist, and I apologize in advance because this is going to shock you, is that Zant's god is actually Ganondorf. Late is the hour in which this conjurer chooses to appear. Yep, he's back, and in this version, Ganondorf is an ex-convict after Link narked on him in the child ending of Ocarina of Time. The sages tried to carry out a death sentence by impaling Ganondorf with a glowing light sword, but the Triforce of Power makes him unkillable. He breaks his shackles, kills the Sage of Water, and pulls the light sword out of his chest hole before the remaining sages quickly seal him in the Twilight Realm. In the Twilight Realm, Ganondorf does a Wizard of Oz and impersonates an all-powerful deity, eventually earning the loyalty of Zant. Your god! Apparently, Zant's curse on Midna can't be broken while Zant's god is alive, so Link and Midna return to Hyrule Castle and finally meet Ganondorf. Ganondorf wants to claim both Midna and Zelda's throne, so he's gotta go. This is actually one of the best ever final boss fights in the series, gameplay-wise. Link plays Dead Man's Volley with a possessed Zelda, and Midna teams up with Wolf Link to face Dark Beast Ganon, which also calls back to ranching skills from the earliest chapter of the game. After the second phase, Midna is seemingly killed by Ganondorf, who curiously reverts back to human form and fights Link and Zelda on horseback, before Link and Ganondorf duel each other on foot. In the end, Link drives the Master Sword through Ganondorf's existing wound, and after experiencing a cryptic vision of Zant snapping his own neck, Ganondorf dies on his feet, sword through his chest. The biggest issue with Twilight Princess is Ganondorf being in the game at all. Not only does his late arrival undermine both Zant and Midna's stories, but more damningly, Ganondorf has no established relationship with any of the characters who oppose him. Of the five main characters, Zelda and Midna bond. Midna and Link are close allies, and Zant has antagonistic relationships with Link, Zelda, and especially Midna. Link has never actually met Zelda in his human form, and has only twice been present in wolf form while she and Midna had a conversation. Only Zant has any connection to Ganondorf, so when the game removes Zant and Midna from the equation and wants me to care about a finale that revolves around Link, Zelda, and Ganondorf, I'm perplexed. The swelling music and 11th hour camaraderie between Link and Zelda in Hyrule Field reminds me of the moment in Rogue One when the guy with the giant gun tells Jin, Good luck, little sister. And I'm thinking, have these two even had a conversation? What is his name? Haven't they known each other for, like, a day? And speaking of Rogue One, Ganondorf's appearance makes me think of the moment Darth Vader showed up, and I wondered, 
what if someone's never seen a Star Wars? They have to be thinking, who is that guy? Why is everyone in my theater cheering? I guess what I'm saying is that fan service for its own sake is bad. And if you're going to sell me on an epic finale with any characters, you have to lay some groundwork first. Would Twilight Princess be a better game if Zant was the only villain and he didn't go nuts halfway through? Yes, but we get what we get. And if nothing else, Zant and Ganon are certainly memorable foes. <laughs> Number 5. Skyward Sword If you've played Skyward Sword, you can picture Girahim's punchable face the instant this theme starts up. Originally conceived as a foil to the usual hulking bad guy, Girahim graced the series with diamond motifs, finger snapping, dramatic hair flips, and a memorable, colorful vocabulary. Hands down the smarmiest and smuggest villain in the series, Girahim is a flamboyant demon who constantly teleports around whatever room he's in and sees himself as the most beautiful and perfect being to ever grace the goddess's green earth. And there's our smudgeness. Link's companion is Phi, the spirit of the Master Sword, and Girahim himself turns out to be the spirit of a rival evil sword, which makes Skyward Sword yet another game in which the villain and the companion are the same type of being and are diametrically opposed. Much as Phi serves Link, Girahim serves his master, Demise, an imprisoned ancient demon king. And wouldn't you know it, he's trying to kidnap Zelda and use her to revive his master. Yes, we've heard that before. Girahim is possibly the most active antagonist in the series, and he definitely shows up more frequently than any other villain. At the start of the game, he conjures up a tornado that sucks Link and Zelda out of the sky, but Zelda eludes capture and sets out on a mysterious quest of her own with Impa. In the first half of the game, Link and Girahim track Zelda through the dungeons, but never fully catch up. Girahim twice fills the role of dungeon boss himself, which is kind of lame from a gameplay perspective, but works on a story level. In his first appearance, he toys with Link and doesn't even attempt to kill him, instead gloating about how powerful he is and catching Link's sword blows with his bare hand. <laughs> At the midpoint of the game, Girahim catches up to Zelda and Impa at the Gate of Time and almost prevails, but at the last second, Link comes to their defense. Zelda is revealed to be the mortal incarnation of the goddess Hylia, and in some paradoxical time shenanigans, she and Impa head to the distant past to seal Demise away, which is why he's trapped in the present, and Impa destroys the gate behind them. Momentarily stymied, Girahim heads off in search of another time portal, and Link leaves to look for sacred flames that can improve the Master Sword. When the two meet again in the depths of the Fire Sanctuary, Girahim bemoans not taking Link more seriously earlier, and promises to make his ears bleed from the sound of his own screams. I have been generous up until now, but I can be cruel. In Girahim's second form, the gloves literally come off, but Link wins anyway, and Girahim sulkily retreats. Meanwhile, the weakest aspect of the game's plot is the Imprisoned, who not only looks ridiculous, but quickly becomes a tedious chore. The Imprisoned is the bestial form of Girahim's master, and apparently he's been locked in an eternal struggle with the goddess Hylia before she sealed him away. Every once in a while, he breaks his seal and makes a beeline for the temple where Impa hangs out. This guy plods around until you whack his toes enough and he falls over and you can whack the spike in his head. At the best of times, it's hard to take an enemy seriously when his toes are his weakness, and this is not an exception. Also, I get that they wanted to keep the game's central threat on the brain, but having me battle the Imprisoned three times instead of dropping a few ominous cutscenes feels like filler for filler's sake. Near the end of the game, Link gets the Triforce and wishes to drop a building on the Imprisoned, apparently crushing both it and Girahim's hopes. However, while Link is celebrating with Groose and the gang, Girahim finally grabs Zelda and pulls a Thanos, traveling back in time to a point where Demise has not yet been killed. Link follows suit and fights through hordes of brainless mooks as Girahim performs his combination dance routine resurrection ritual on Zelda. True to form, Girahim has concocted a dramatic and extravagant method of fighting Link, and he's even branded it, the Endless Plunge. This is actually a hint, and after Link stabs Girahim repeatedly, his flawless form begins to show cracks, and he incredulously admits defeat. Nevertheless, the resurrection was still happening in the background, and Demise emerges from the mist. Girahim is positively gleeful to be of service to his master, and assumes his final form as Demise pulls the Dark Master Sword out of his broken body. I guess you'd have to say that Girahim was successful in the end. He set out to capture Zelda and revive his master, and ultimately he does just that. Demise is all like, No human can stand against me. But Link is unfazed and challenges Demise to a 1v1 duel in the middle of a lightning storm, with each wielding one of the twin swords and hurling supercharged skyward strikes at each other. I'm not about to sing the praises of the sword controls in this game, but the final battle does feel like a culmination of all the techniques introduced in the game. Eventually Link gains the upper hand and finishes Demise in a manner extremely reminiscent of Ganondorf's death in Twilight Princess. 
Demise is most famous for cursing Link and Zelda with his dying breath, promising that an incarnation of his hatred will plague them throughout the ages. And it's implied that this curse is responsible for the recurring conflict between Link, Zelda, and Ganondorf that predominates the series. Not a bad legacy for a one-off villain. It's worth saying that I don't like Skyward Sword overall. It's repetitive, ultra-linear, stuffed with blatant filler, and the hand-holding is at an all-time high. But Girahim shows that even a mediocre Zelda title can deliver an unforgettable villain. <laughs> Number 4. A Link Between Worlds when they announced that they were remaking, remixing, whatever they were doing to A Link to the Past, my expectations were low. But Link Between Worlds knocked it out of the park with stellar gameplay and a surprisingly deep story. The plot revolves around an alternate dimension parallel version of Hyrule, called Low Rule, which collides with Hyrule when a crack in the space-time continuum mysteriously appears in a wall. Two parts of space and time that should never have touched. Pressed together. The cackling wizard Yuga emerges through the crack and begins kidnapping descendants of the Seven Sages, as you do when you're a Zelda villain. Yuga is the alternate universe version of Ganondorf, and presumably the main villain of the game. He's obsessed with beauty and perfection, and his signature move is using his paintbrush wand to transform victims into paintings. And I have another one of them in the nude. But that one is for me. Like Girahim, Yuga shows up repeatedly in Link's journey, and also like Girahim, is the boss of the first dungeon. After the battle, Yuga decides that Link could be a problem, and magics him into a mural, which is honestly pretty trope-savvy for a Zelda villain. However, Link had earlier received an old bracelet from Ravio, the mysterious merchant in a purple bunny costume, and Ravio's bracelet combined with Yuga's curse gives Link the ability to merge in and out of painting form. This is like Twilight Princess, where a curse from the villain accidentally gives Link the ability he needs to complete the game. One improvement over Link to the past is that we actually know the kidnapped sages, Instead of generic maiden MacGuffins, who were kidnapped before the game even began, the Sages and LBW go missing one by one, and Link has at least one interaction with each of them before they disappear. By the time Link acquires the Master Sword, Yuga has kidnapped all seven Sages, and Link arrives just in time to see him transform Zelda into a painting. Link fights Yuga a second time, but Yuga is kind of a wimp, and prefers trickery to combat. After a short fight, he flees to low rule with Link in hot pursuit, and we see the crack in Zelda's bedroom wall through which Yuga entered the kingdom. Yuga uses his art collection to revive Ganon, but in a completely unprecedented development, Ganon does not then become the villain of the game. Instead, Yuga takes the Triforce of Power and fuses with Ganon to become Yuga Ganon, retaining his original personality and goals. Before Yuga Ganon can trample Link, a dark-haired figure appears and uses magic to hold the beast at bay, and we meet the game's most complex character, Princess Hilda. Hey. Hilda is Zelda's counterpart, and she's presented initially as an embattled ruler struggling to protect and preserve her nation. She provides Link with guidance on his quest, but warns that Low Rule is a dangerous place. The backstory here is that Low Rule used to have its own Triforce, but after a string of endless wars, Hilda's ancestors destroyed it in hopes of ending the conflict. This turned out to be a tragic mistake, because the Triforce was the metaphysical glue holding everything together, and now Hilda's kingdom is slowly disintegrating into chaos. All seemed lost for Hilda and Low Rule when the crack in the wall appeared, and Hilda learned of another Triforce, one that could replace Low Rule's. The major twist of Link Between Worlds is that Hilda and Yuga are working together to steal Hyrule's Triforce. That's why Yuga kidnapped Zelda, and that's why he revived Ganon. Yuga and Hilda crafted a quest for Link to complete that would prove him worthy to claim the Triforce of Courage, and Hilda posed as an ally, steering Link in the right direction. This is such a fresh take, and it's also hinted at before the reveal. After capturing the very first sage, Yuga says, Her Grace will be pleased, and Hilda is standing by Zelda's portrait in all of her confessional cutscenes. I'll call your attention to one particularly clever bit of writing, when Hilda says of Link, I must have courage. He will succeed or all is lost. At first it seems like a personal pep talk, but really she means that she must have the Triforce of Courage. Good stuff. Hilda is not necessarily evil, but she'll do whatever it takes to save her kingdom. After saving the Seven Sages, Link storms Low Rule Castle, where the climax of the game goes down. Hilda reveals her treachery and takes the Triforce of Wisdom from Zelda's portrait. She then summons Yuga Ganon to steal the Triforce of Courage from Link, but this time Link is a match for the fused monster and prevails. Enraged by her servant's failure, Hilda demands the Triforce of Power from Yuga, but he betrays her, turns her into a painting, and takes the Triforce of Wisdom for himself, revealing that he never cared about saving the kingdom. Oh, she has been well and truly hoist by her own petard. <laughs> Yuga Ganon, now powered by two-thirds of the Triforce, faces Link, the only person he can't turn into a painting, and threatens to claim the final third, but Link is not about to give up the Triforce of Courage. We are bonded forever. 
In the ensuing battle, Link shows what he's made of. He uses Ravio's bracelet and Zelda's bow of light for an epic boss fight that flits between the second and third dimensions, and defeats Yuga once and for all. Yuga's downfall removes the curse on both Zelda and Hilda, and at first, Hilda remains intent on taking Link and Zelda's Triforces. But suddenly, Ravio appears and reveals himself to be Link's Lorulian counterpart. He explains that he lacked the courage to confront Hilda earlier, and reminds her that this kind of conflict is exactly why their ancestors destroyed the Triforce in the first place. Hilda was driven by dreams of a future for her people, but after Ravio's speech, she has a genuine change of heart. It was my dream. Sometimes, to do what's right, we have to be steady and give up the thing we want the most. Even our dreams. Hilda and Ravio bravely decide to go down with the ship, after Hilda uses the last of her power to send Link and Zelda back to Hyrule. Resigned to their fate, the two stand together in the ruins of their crumbling kingdom. It's a somber, bittersweet ending for the beleaguered princess and her reluctant hero, but it's an especially poignant ending because, in the face of their inevitable doom, Hilda finally shows real wisdom and Ravio finds his courage. But then, when all seems lost, Link and Zelda use their Triforce and wish to save Low Rule. Princess Hilda can't believe her eyes, but the Triforce of Low Rule is restored and the sun shines on her kingdom once again. The Low Rule saga concludes, and Link Between Worlds is best remembered as the portrait of a misguided princess who finds her way back to wisdom and redemption. <laughs> Number 3. The Wind Waker the Ganondorf of Wind Waker is certainly the Gerudo King's most sympathetic portrayal, and probably his most interesting as well. It's also the most human, as this is the only version of Ganondorf who never transforms into the mindless monster Ganon. This is the same Ganondorf from Ocarina of Time, but he's grown a beard, put on some weight, and gotten a lot more genre savvy. He's also rocking a dope jacket with distinctive talon designs, which might be styled after his giant henchbird, the Helmarok King. A big story element of Wind Waker is the contrast between the Old Guard and the New Generation. Link and Tetra are members of the New Generation, and they initially have no stake in the age-old conflict that gradually unfolds. Ganondorf, however, is quite old, and along with other ancient characters like Valu, the Great Deku Tree, and the King of Red Lions, he predates the Great Flood and is nostalgic for the kingdom beneath the waves. In this timeline, Ganondorf attacked Hyrule, but no hero appeared to stop him. The people of Hyrule desperately cried out for their gods to save them, and the gods responded by sending a worldwide flood and sinking the kingdom into the ocean depths. For a time, Ganondorf was sealed away, but by the start of Wind Waker, he's broken the seal and re-established himself at the Forsaken Fortress, an ominous tower in the far north where pirates fear to tread and postmen dare not deliver mail. Wind Waker is really the only game where Ganondorf's motivations go beyond me evil must destroy. Late in the story, Ganondorf gives this great speech about how wind meant life and growth to the green land of Hyrule, but only brought harsh sands and frigid nights and death to the Gerudo Desert. This implies that his primary reason for invading Hyrule is a case of the grass is always greener, or in other words, I don't like sand. Anyway, Ganondorf is PO'd about the gods flooding Hyrule, and he wants to make Hyrule great again, something he plans to accomplish by assembling the Triforce and wishing to unsubmerge the old kingdom. The problem is, there hasn't been a hero in generations, and Zelda's royal line has apparently ended, so Ganondorf is two triangles short of a Triforce. He's been sending out his feathered minion to kidnap girls with pointy ears from nearby islands, but so far the search has yet to yield a princess. This is how Link becomes involved in the plot, because one of the kidnapped victims is Link's little sister, Errol. This is a great source of personal stakes, and it's also that trope as old as time where villains inadvertently sow the seeds of their own defeat. The King of Red Lions, Link's anthropomorphic sailboat, tells Link about a powerful weapon that can defeat Ganondorf, and advises Link on a quest to collect three magical pearls and prove himself worthy of the gods who sealed the kingdom away. The pair travel beneath the surface and discover that Hyrule Castle is completely intact, apparently frozen in time at the exact moment that Ganon's forces attacked. Link pulls the Master Sword out of its pedestal, but it's a real catch-22, because while the Master Sword is required to defeat Ganondorf, it also functioned as a key that locked away the bulk of Ganondorf's power. Link returns to Forsaken Fortress, rescues his sister, and kills the Helmarok King, but Ganondorf is unfazed by the Master Sword. Ganondorf says, and I quote, that the Master Sword does not sparkle with the power to repel evil. Ganondorf has played a Zelda game or two before, and unlike other incarnations, does not possess the fatal flaw of underestimating Link and the Master Sword. Yeah, well, maybe next time you will estimate me. 
To that end, Ganondorf reveals, he has gone around murdering sages, which has the effect of sapping the Master Sword's power and also prevents them from sealing him away at the last second, as they've done before on multiple occasions. At this moment, Tetra appears, and Ganondorf is shocked to discover that his Triforce of Power responds to her presence. Tetra is revealed to be Princess Zelda, and Ganondorf almost wins right here and now, except for an intervention by Valu and the Rito, during which Ganondorf survives a blast of dragonfire. Link, Zelda, and the King of Red Lions escape to Hyrule Castle, where the reveals keep coming. The King of Red Lions turns out to be Daphnis Nohansen Hyrule, Zelda's ancestor who was king at the time of the Great Flood. Like Ganondorf, the King of Red Lions wants to restore Hyrule, he just doesn't want Ganondorf included. If you're keeping track, this makes Wind Waker yet another game where the primary conflict is between the villain and Link's companion. Link restores the Master Sword with the help of Medley and Makar, who awaken as sages with a little help from their ancestors. This furthers the theme of passing the torch from one generation to the next. Master Sword in hand, Link travels below the surface to face Ganondorf, and the final confrontation is my personal favorite in the series. Ganondorf reveals that he expected a hero to rise up, and even has a begrudging respect for Link. Instead of facing Link head-on, he initially hides behind Puppet Ganon, which might be a pragmatic choice because Ganondorf has learned from experience that fighting Link is not a good idea. In any case, Link defeats the puppet monster and joins Ganondorf and Zelda atop the highest tower. Ganondorf muses that he's gathered the three holders of the Triforce in the same place for the second time. He brushes Link and Zelda aside and assembles the full Triforce, ready to wish for the restoration of Hyrule. He then literally loses on a technicality. Rules lawyer King Daphnis materializes, reminds Ganondorf that actually, the rules say you have to be touching the Triforce, and basically steals Ganondorf's wish. To add insult to injury, the king has a change of heart and wishes to drown the old kingdom, placing his faith in Link and Zelda for a future free of this conflict. This is a powerful moment because Ganondorf and King Daphnis are character foils who share similar motivations, but unlike Ganondorf, the King of Red Lions is finally able to let go of the past. As the kingdom begins to flood, Ganondorf loses it, and lets loose a completely unhinged guttural laugh. Link and Zelda stand together, but a half-defeated Ganondorf draws his twin swords and says he'll use his final moments to blot out their future. There's something intensely personal about fighting a villain who's already lost. The fate of the world is explicitly not at stake. This fight is purely about survival and living to see the future. I always like when Link and Zelda team up to fight Ganondorf, and it feels more earned this time around than, say, Twilight Princess. Of course this fight is most remembered for the most shocking and brutal final blow in the series. After Zelda lands a trick shot with the light arrows, Link parries, leaps into the air, and rams the Master Sword into Ganondorf's head. Finish him. Oh, for the head. Ganondorf dies with a smile on his face, after uttering his famous last words which call back to his speech about the wind. This is one of the very few times that Ganondorf is actually killed, and as his body turns to stone, his ultimate fate is to become a permanent part of the kingdom he coveted. King Daphnis too remains in the flooding Hyrule, and the ocean washes away the last remnants of conflict from a forgotten past. As per his last wish, the game ends on a hopeful note, as Link and Zelda embark on a mission to explore strange new worlds. And as subsequent games in this timeline show, we know that Ganondorf has finally been laid to rest. <laughs> Number 2. Ocarina of Time Let me briefly sum up the plot of this game. The heroes, that's Link and Zelda, learn that a villainous warlord is searching for magical stones in order to claim an artifact that alters reality and grants wishes. They attempt to thwart him by collecting the stones themselves, but the villain tricks them, claims the stones, and makes his wish. Cut to black, fast forward several years, and the villain has basically won. The land is devastated, and many allies are now missing or dead. But suddenly, one of the heroes emerges from time stasis and now knows how to time travel. The heroes embark on a time-bending quest through recent history in order to gather six elemental artifacts that can reverse the devastation and bring back their missing allies from the original timeline for a final showdown in the ruins of a collapsed base, where all the heroes team up to bring down the big bad once and for all. Listen, it worked for the Avengers, and it works for Ocarina of Time. And Ocarina did it first. But this is a villain ranking, so here's my case for why Ganondorf deserves the number two spot. First, he's one of the few villains who actually wins, and not just momentarily wins by kidnapping or cursing a princess. He utterly wins, and rules Hyrule unopposed for seven years. After collecting the spiritual stones, Link returns to Hyrule Castle just in time to see Zelda and Impa fleeing the castle, and it's clear that something has gone badly wrong. Ganondorf has orchestrated a coup and killed the King of Hyrule, and when Link opens the Door of Time, Ganondorf reveals that he spared Link in order to follow him and enter the Sacred Realm. Link is sealed away with the Master Sword, and with Zelda in hiding, 
Ganondorf is left unchecked for the next seven years. Second, what Ocarina of Time does better than almost any other game in the series is make you feel the damage being done to the characters of the game world. When Adult Link leaves the Temple of Time, the first thing you see is the burnt out, zombified remains of the once bustling castle town, and it's one of the best wham moments in video game history. As Link revisits locations from his childhood, it's clear that no location is left unscathed. His hometown is overrun with monsters, the Gorons have been imprisoned, and Zora's domain is frozen over. We got to know these places and peoples in the first act, so seeing them in ruins has real impact. Even smaller changes provide a sense of unease, like Ingo gaining control of Lon Lon Ranch and forcing Malon to work for him. Link is able to right some of these wrongs, but the time skip is so brilliant because it means that Ganondorf's devastation is dynamic and personal, instead of something we merely read about in the manual. Third, this is the first game in the series that really delves into the villain's backstory and rise to power. For once, Ganondorf is not openly villainous at the start of the game, although we hear that he's tried to extort the leaders of the Kokiri, the Gorons, and the Zora, and the Decatree warns that Link must not allow Ganondorf to enter the Sacred Realm. Both Link and Zelda have prophetic dreams about the threat of Ganondorf, possibly because of their future connection through the Triforce, and Zelda herself tries to warn her father, but he doesn't believe her because she's just a kid. The pair spy on Ganondorf through the castle window, and he briefly makes eye contact with Link and Zelda, which is kind of fun foreshadowing. For the first time in the series, we actually meet the Gerudo. I'm a sucker for an 11th hour visit to the villain's hometown, and making Ganondorf's desert kingdom the last stop on the road to Ganon's castle is a nice touch. We learn that Ganondorf comes from a tribe of all-female thieves, who only give birth to a male every hundred years. That male is chosen from birth to be their leader, which gives Ganondorf the pathology of an entitled bully who grew up being worshipped by everyone around him. We also meet Ganondorf's moms, and having the last sage come from the Gerudo adds a bit of rebel flair to the story. Finally, Ocarina of Time set a new standard for Epic. Yes, later games have better graphics and grander spectacle, but 20 years later, Ocarina is an unforgettable journey, and its characters undergo meaningful change. Child Link and Zelda have a real innocence about them, and even the guard at the foot of Death Mountain laughs and calls their efforts to save Hyrule a funny game. But by the end of the story, you feel that they've absorbed the weight of the world, and Zelda regretfully looks back on how naive she was as a child. At a time when the Zelda series itself was maturing, Ocarina of Time is a dark and deep coming-of-age story, and the climax of the game matches the scale of the adventure. In the final act, Zelda reveals herself, and is promptly captured by Ganondorf. Ganondorf says that his only mistake has been to slightly underestimate Link, or more properly, the Triforce of Courage. It's thrilling to finally storm Ganon's castle, and ascending the central tower to the tune of Ganondorf playing the organ is deliciously ominous. In the penthouse suite, Link does battle with Ganondorf, and all the classics are there. Dead Man's Volley, the Light Arrows, and some hack and slash with the Master Sword. Afterwards, Ganondorf pukes, or pukes blood, or pukes green blood, depending on your interpretation and your cartridge version, and apparently dies. With his last breath, he causes his base to self-destruct, but Link and Zelda escape the wreckage, and it seems like Ganondorf's reign of terror is finally over. But then Ganondorf rises above the ruin, and for the first time in Zelda canon, transforms into Ganon. Unlike other bosses who have descriptors like Parasitic Armored Arachnid or Subterranean Lava Dragon, the final title card simply says Ganon. I will say this fight is laughably easy, but the soundtrack, the lighting, and Ganon's design make for an unforgettable climax. With Zelda's help, Link uses the Master Sword and delivers the final blow, before the sages gather to seal Ganon away in the Sacred Realm. And of course, the sealed Ganon will resonate throughout the rest of the series. <laughs> it's my number one with a bullet, Majora's Mask. Majora's Mask is a dark and creepy story about a mysterious masked stranger who shows up in a bustling town and uses a stolen ancient power to unleash massive destruction and plunge the world into chaos. It tells genuinely human stories, and it turns out was exactly right about how much masks would be involved in the end times. Majora's Mask follows Link after riding off into the sunset at the end of Ocarina of Time, and begins when Link is attacked and mugged by Skull Kid who is wearing the titular Majora's Mask. Skull Kid steals the Ocarina of Time, scares off Epona, and amuses himself by cursing Link and transforming him into a Deku Scrub. Link follows Skull Kid down the rabbit hole and enters a parallel world called Termina, where Skull Kid uses the power of Majora's Mask to wreak havoc and set the moon on a collision course with Clock Town. In order to reverse the curse, Link forms an unholy alliance with the world's creepiest NPC, the Happy Mask Salesman. The Happy Mask Salesman explains that Majora's Mask is an ancient relic of untold evil power, which he was able to add to his collection only after great difficulty. He too was recently mugged by Skull Kid, and Majora's Mask was stolen. 
which according to the Happy Mask Salesman is an emergency akin to a rogue state gaining access to nuclear weapons. Link only has three days to retrieve Majora's Mask and avert a lunar apocalypse, which seems like an impossible task, except Link has the goddess of time on his side and is soon sucked into a 72-hour Groundhog Day-esque time loop and must relive the same three days over and over while attempting to thwart Skull Kid and Majora. Before Majora's Mask, Skull Kid was a mischievous but harmless forest imp who enjoyed music and loved playing pranks on his friends. We actually met him first in Ocarina of Time, where he purchased the Skull Mask from Link in order to seem more intimidating. Later we learn more about Skull Kid's backstory in the story told by Andrew's grandmother. Skull Kid used to be friends with the four guardian giants who protect Termina, but some time ago they departed and left him alone. Skull Kid is rejected and hurt, although Tattle suggests that no one wants to play with him because he's always playing tricks on his friends. Sorry I annoyed you with my friendship. Lonely, embittered, and antisocial, Skull Kid's childish motives are real-life terrifying, and not to get too dark, but his displaced rage makes me think of a school shooter. The rest of the story is the tragic result of a petulant kid who stumbles onto a powerful weapon he doesn't fully comprehend, and embarks on a series of murderous pranks. Of course, Skull Kid would be nothing without Majora's Mask itself. Majora's Mask is an evil artifact with a mind of its own that emanates power and calls out to those nearby, like the One Ring or Jumanji. The Happy Mask Salesman could feel its power, and Skull Kid was drawn to it as well. The mask exerts an evil influence on the wearer, but also grants incredible powers and amplifies the worst parts of the wearer's personality. In Skull Kid's case, his penchant for pranks has been amplified to global proportions. When you observe Skull Kid through the Astral Observatory telescope, he taunts Link and looks up at the moon, as if to indicate that this too is nothing more than a joke. Do you get it? He's mooning them? Under the influence of Majora's Mask, Skull Kid is an omnicidal lunatic who delights in the suffering of others. Most villains on this list are totalitarian tyrants, but Skull Kid is, in effect, a terrorist. He represents chaos and anarchy, and most of the game is a scramble to restore order while Skull Kid sits back and laughs. Some men just want to watch the world burn. Skull Kid is in it for the lols, and that's why he's so terrifying. More than any other Zelda game world, Termina tells the story of its villain. In Clock Town alone, Skull Kid threatens to break the astronomer's instruments and transforms Cafe into a child for no apparent reason other than to humiliate him. But his larger impact is simply the threat of lunar disaster. On the first day, there's a lot of debate over whether the moon is actually falling, and there is something frighteningly modern about an existential threat that everyone just ignores. By the third day, Clock Town's imminent destruction becomes impossible to deny. Some evacuate, some cower in their homes, others drink away their sorrows at the bar, and the chief denier stands in the town square laughing maniacally. There's no escape for anyone, and it's chilling. Elsewhere, Skull Kid is directly or indirectly responsible for the deaths of at least Darmani, Macau, and the Deku Butler's son. He's caused environmental disasters in Woodfall, Snowhead, and the Great Bay, attacked great fairies, disrupted dairy supply chains, incited piracy, and most relevant to the plot, imprisoned the four guardian giants using evil transformation masks. Everywhere he goes, Skull Kid spreads grief and chaos. Seeing the world react to troubles big and small is so atmospheric, and it's really a huge part of why this game works. By contrast, Link's goals, and also his major songs on the ocarina, involve healing and order. During his travels, Link is able to heal many wounds, albeit temporarily, and the three-day cycle is a desperate juggling act to restore order to a world that is rapidly deteriorating. Slowly but surely, Link begins to free the four giants, and makes plans to turn the tables on Skull Kid. The giants are sad that Skull Kid is in pain and causing pain, and they urge Tattle to forgive her friend, after teaching Link the song that can summon them to the final confrontation. In the words of Skull Kid, if it's something that can be stopped, then just try to stop it. Part of what makes Majora's Mask so terrifying is the inexorable march towards Lunar Apocalypse. The doomsday clock at the bottom of the screen never lets you feel at ease, and the grotesquely grinning moon can be seen approaching from anywhere on the map. Even the background music grows more and more frantic over the three days, ultimately culminating in the final hours track and visible screen rumbles as the end of the world draws near. If you do allow the moon to crash into Clock Town, everyone and everything is destroyed, and Link loses all progress made over the three days, making this easily the most devastating game over in the Zelda series. For most of the game, Link can only delay the inevitable, but eventually he frees the spirits of the four giants who can put a stop to Skull Kid. In the final three-day cycle, Link plays the Oath to Order and summons the giants to catch the falling moon. 
Skull Kid collapses and Tattle and Tail reunite, but then, like something out of a horror flick, we hear Majora's voice for the first time. Majora says a puppet that can no longer be used is mere garbage, and shakes off Skull Kid's unconscious body. The mask flies into the moon, and the moon's eyes begin to glow, and it threatens to consume everything. Maybe this is Majora's ultimate desire. Despite Tattle's pleas to reverse time, Link follows Majora and is beamed up into the moon. The interior of the moon is bizarrely serene. Four children wearing the four giants masks and modeled after the happy mask salesman are playing around a central tree and ask Link creepy questions like what his true face looks like and whether he too will become a mask salesman. It seems like Majora has absorbed some of Skull Kid's personality because he's sulking alone while the four kids in giants masks play without him. When you finally talk to him, he asks Link to play good guys and bad guys, further underlining the fact that the fate of the world is just a game to Majora. Majora says he'll be the good guy, and sucks Link into a psychedelic chamber for the final showdown. This fight is among the more challenging. Unless you have the Fierce Deities mask, in which case Link is like, I'm about to end this man's whole career. Done. Using the Fierce Deities mask makes the fight feel like putting down a rabid dog, and also makes the climax feel like a morally gray resolution. Just monsters fighting monsters. After curb stomping three increasingly grotesque forms, Majora gives up the ghost, and the mood is not triumphant, but a mixture of relief and revulsion. After the dark power leaves Majora's mask, the main characters gather one last time and term in a field. Free of Majora's influence, Skull Kid is ashamed of his actions, and taken aback that the four giants still considered him to be a friend. Tattle and Tail forgive the Skull Kid, and he asks if Link will be his friend as well. It's actually a very tender moral for such a dark story. The Happy Mask Salesman leaves with Majora's Mask, and tells the group that whenever there is a meeting, a parting is sure to follow. Link leaves alone, and thus closes the darkest chapter in the Zelda series. And as far as I'm concerned, Skull Kid and Majora are hands down the best Zelda villain. Thanks for watching. I love how many different directions the Zelda series has gone with its villains, and 35 years in, the series is still innovating. I can't wait to see where they take Zelda villains in the Breath of the Wild sequel and beyond. I did spend a lot of time putting this together, so a like or a share would be immensely appreciated. This is a big subjective topic, but I had a ton of fun looking back at all the series' villains. Drop a comment to let me know where you agree with my rankings and where I went wildly wrong. Who's your favorite Zelda villain and why? And with the Breath of the Wild sequel on the way, leave your prediction on the future of Zelda villainy. I'm working hard on a few other videos, so if you enjoy this kind of content, do me a solid and subscribe, and you can check those out when I finish them. Thanks again, and see you in the next one.